Yeah. Um, one of our, our regular viewers, CG, just pointed out that looks like Weston is dressed for a funeral. Uh, and another one of our viewers has asked if the funeral is uh, JPY. Hey everyone, Weston Akamura from Real Vision in Tokyo. So we have a big week of central bank policies happening for which global cross asset markets are currently being dictated. But the focus is for Friday, the Bank of Japan, for which this video will be a guide for. Now, let me first start off by saying that I don't actually have a concrete view of what BOJ will or won't do at the policy meeting on Friday. And that's because any BOJ-related view would have to come after the Fed decision, or rather after seeing what the market reaction to the FOMC meeting is, as well as the Bank of England um, and all that too. And those things have not happened yet. But with that said, when it comes to the BOJ, which is a major central bank who is actively in the markets every single day trying to control the yield curve and announcing things mid-Japan trading day regarding their JGB buying operations. As per the last BOJ meeting in which they unveiled this current policy of daily unlimited bond buying operations as necessary in order to cap 10-year JGB yields in a surging global yield environment, when you have a central bank battling markets every single day, then every day is a BOJ policy meeting day. And so what I'm going to do is just to give these sort of updates as developments occur leading up to BOJ day on Friday and then do sort of a recap looking back uh, big picture. Now, speaking of day-to-day -day markets and of looking back big picture, let's just take a look at the global market picture from yesterday, Monday, okay, which was arguably the biggest cross asset indiscriminate throat slicing bloodbath of 2022 so far. A lot of headlines really crossing here, but according to my measures, we are seeing the biggest decline in the S&P 500 now since March 23rd of 2020. On that day, that market had fallen more than 11 and a half percent, but indeed today it is a market that is dropping about 150 points to about 3.9 percent lower on the S&P 500. A lot of numbers, at least 250 of these, really down more than 20 percent here from some of the record highs that we had on January 3rd of this year. So that is really dragging down the market to the lowest levels that we haven't seen since about January of 2021. What is so interesting, Carol, is the market, the NASDAQ looks worse on the day, about 4.7%, but it actually is really only the worst day that I'm looking at since May of this year. So first of all, you talk about volatility, the VIX uh, closing at 34.34, so up about six and a half point. You talk about big tech, Microsoft, Meta, um, Oracle, Intel, these are all among the big tech names that hit 52-week lows today, guys, in the session. It's clear to me that the market is in distress. I mean, the sector performance alone tells you a lot about just how weak and how broad the market weakness has been over the course of today. Intriguingly, energy stocks, some of the worst stocks in the market, which is a very big shift in trend relative to where we've been all year, the energy stocks leading the way. Finally, some signs of capitulation there. Utilities and real estate stocks also among the weakest stocks in the market. Those are typically more stable, lower beta segments. I mean, just look at the losers. The list of losers tends to be concentrated in year-to-date relative winners, which is a very big signal. Looking at the worst two-day bond route since 1987, we're looking at equity indices from Japan and Asia to Europe to the U.S. down 3%, 4%, 5% intraday. We're looking at the S&P 500 finally having entered official bear market territory. And we're also looking at pure risk asset markets like crypto. BTC is down double digits. ETH is down nearly 20% 24 hours. Clearly, this is a indiscriminate cross-asset global risk-off liquidation. Now, I know that we're used to these sort of bad days in markets in 2022, but I think we could all agree that this one from Monday, this was a different breed of global rush to liquidation. Why is this happening? What's different this time? Well, many will say this is from Friday's US CPI coming in higher than expected in the high 8% range and uh, 75 basis point rate hikes from the FOMC is now becoming a consensus for this upcoming Fed meeting. Now, I would agree that Friday's US CPI print was the catalyst and this kind of renewed consensus hawkishness. But this isn't the first high inflation reading we've had before. Right? We've seen this movie seemingly countless times before. 
with like very high CPI prints and sell-offs in equity markets led by tech and bonds as you know bond yield spike that hitting risk assets. It's not like CPI printed an eight handle on Friday against previous readings of like one percent. So, what was actually different this time that caused this like Monday massacre? Was there even anything different? Indeed, there was. What happened was that the Bank of Japan lost control of yield curve control. And the JGB market absolutely tanked. JGB yields surged way above the 25 basis point upper band limit of yield curve control, which then triggered sovereign yields, very much including the US Treasury market, to also surge, which then destroyed risk assets across the board in a complete massacre. And this is exactly why I had flagged the BOJ in the first place, starting in late January, early February of this year, um, and all this time since then. It's because of this very scenario. But I made my original video called Why Global Markets Are Addicted to the Bank of Japan after the, the uh, January BOJ policy meeting, because I was warning that things have now changed and the BOJ is now the most consequential central bank to risk asset markets. Take a look at this clip from the original video. Bank of Japan cannot start to unwind and start selling JGBs into a non-existent market that they own more than half of. Bank of Japan's yield curve control is indirect US yield curve control. You have piles of yen in need of yield. If JGB yields are pinned at zero, then Japanese investors buy overseas bonds like US Treasuries and thereby cap US Treasury yields. If not for the Bank of Japan pushing yield-starved Japanese investors overseas, US and global yields and credit spreads would be through the fucking roof. And thereby, the S&P 500 and the tech stocks and all that would be through the fucking floor in this current environment. It's because of the Bank of Japan and their insanely accommodative and globally impacting easing policy that's been running for the last half a decade. If yields continue to climb and it calls for BOJ to do a fixed rate operation and they offer to buy an unlimited amount of JDBs at a time when global central banks are tapering, that makes Japan the sole bond market manipulating, free market destroying policy force left. And Japan's the only economy left in the hospital bed that's in need of like this ICU care. It undermines the efficacy of the policy itself. The other side is that if BOJ abandons yield curve control, global markets will implode. CPI comes out in a little bit in, for the United States if like, yields blast through 2%, which I believe that they will because of the options positioning on our 10-year US Treasury futures. If US Treasuries are yielding above 2%, then Bank of Japan is going to have a fixed rate operation. And if Bank of Japan can't handle that fixed rate operation, things can get very ugly very, very quickly. And global investors, all of you, Cross asset, I don't care what it is that you trade or invest or whatever. Every other central bank is about to abandon a decade of this artificial, you know, intervention as if there's going to be no consequences. Th those consequences are being held at bay because of the Bank of Japan. A, can the Bank of Japan handle that by themselves? And B, what happens if they cannot or will not? You're looking at a completely different world in markets, absent the Bank of Japan accommodative policy that is the only policy that is still in place. Okay, so pay attention to the Bank of Japan. You didn't really have to until now. You definitely have to now. It is the most consequential because people are not paying attention and because it is actually the most consequential for the reasons I just mentioned. So in this video, as well as the follow-up series of videos on the subject, what I'm going to do is to take a look at markets through the lens and context of the Bank of Japan and their policy and their actions and kind of just break it down by asset class, the actual global bond markets, not just the JDB market, as well as Japanese capital flows, which have been killing the US Treasury market for the worst Q1 on record for fixed income total return performance. And then separately, I'm gonna discuss the yen, um, which obviously, you know, can't really be done that separately from the bond market, but there are FX idiosyncrasies underway as well, so it does warrant some sort of compartmentalization of these sort of topics of discussion by asset class. And then finally, I'm going to discuss the Bank of Japan itself, the state that it finds itself in, what's happening on the ground domestically here in Tokyo, um, as Japan is possibly on the verge of, dare I say, potential sustained inflation, and more significantly, a 
central bank that's easing into inflation because they're so deep in the easing hole that they only have bad options available, uh, as well as very key sort of catalysts ahead, namely the upper house elections in Japan, the results of which are going to heavily influence who the successor for Bank of Japan, Governor Kuroda, current Governor Kuroda, uh, will be when his term is up in less than a year, April 2023. Okay, so there's a ton to cover, so let's get started. Okay, so let's talk about the yen, okay, and this topic of yen intervention specifically. Um, so I want to talk about, first of all, the yen getting crushed as the worst performing currency year to date against the dollar, worst performing major currency um, against the dollar. Uh, why that's happening, um, the incredible speed in which it's happening. Um, and I also want to discuss the CN intervention topic and my view, which is that I do not believe that yen intervention is something that is a high probability event happening anytime soon. I don't think that we're close there yet, despite the yen reaching these levels. Currently, at the time of this recording, the yen is well into the 130 handle, approaching 135. It is the worst performing currency against the dollar, and it is of major concern, and not from the standpoint of somebody who is in Japan. I mean, it is something that everybody uh, who is paying attention to global macro uh, either already obviously knows about um, or should be certainly concerned uh, about and should be watching very carefully. Now, usually I have to do this sort of why you should care part of the video, right? Like about the various things that I bring up or talk about, um, you know, why this matters to, you know, your equity portfolio in the United States or wherever you might be. And obviously the, I don't make these videos if they aren't of broad consequence and significance to a very diverse and broad audience um, out there. But rather than me tell you, I'm actually going to once again rely on Mr. James Aiken, who I've used before for my Levergrand video. But Mr. James Aiken, he was back on Real Vision talking to Ral recently, and they discussed not just the yen, but they discussed the Bank of Japan, JGBs, you know, everything going on with that. And so I'm going to be using clips of that video for the JGB and rates discussion as well in my separate video. But for now, here is an actual, credible, highly experienced, extremely smart, expert's expert, as Ral calls him, Mr. James Aiken on Dollar Yen. What the hell is going on? Because there's something going on in Japan and people aren't yet focused. We've done a couple of pieces on Real Vision, but everybody's kind of looking the other way and they're not seeing it. What do you think? I think any macro variable that breaks out of a three decade or thereabouts trend is hugely interesting, particularly when it attracts barely a ripple of commentary. Here is something that you and I and many of our friends grew up with through the 90s in markets saying dollar yen is the key macro variable. If I know where dollar yen's going, I can figure out the long bond, I can figure out stocks, I can figure out so many things, right? And then like a lot of assets over the past several years, dollar yen didn't become a low vol asset. It, become a, it became a no vol <laughs> asset, right? Zero vol. Remarkable. You heard it from the man himself. Dollar yen is the macro uh, variable. And if you can figure out where dollar yen is going, you can figure out rates, you can figure out stocks, and so on and so forth. Uh, what I will say, however, is something that I've repeated at nauseum, that I've tweeted charts uh, about, uh, I talk about on the Real Vision Daily Briefing every time I go on, and something that is, you know is in these videos so again and again and again. And that is simply, just look at a chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield versus USD JPY. They mirror one another. Obviously not all the time and obviously to differing degrees, but by and large, they mirror one another. And this is both, you know, over longer term horizons and intraday, you know, on a one minute tick for tick chart, dollar yen, 10 year US treasury yield. They're very, very highly correlated for two completely different asset classes. And look, there's multiple reasons why that this relationship, this phenomenon occurs, and I'm not going to get into them. But if you want the 101 elevator pitch version, okay, 
just go back to the most basic of like FX price action driver fundamentals. Yield spreads, yield differentials between two countries, and the relative attractiveness of nominal yield spreads. Here is a higher yield, here is a lower yield, the lower yielding currency gets sold for the higher yielding currency because there is more yield to get with that other currency. I'm putting aside real yields, I'm putting aside FX hedging and all that kind of stuff, okay? When it comes to dollar yen, you have JGB 10-year yield, which is nailed down by policy from the Bank of Japan's yield curve control, who is capping 10-year yields at around zero. That means that the U.S. to Japan yield spread is based on whatever the U.S. yield is doing, okay? So JGB yields are static. U.S. yields are going to fluctuate however they do. And so therefore, the U.S. to Japan yield spread is going to be whatever it is that the U.S. yield is doing. And therefore, the dollar-yen price action is going to mirror that of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. That's why USDJPY and the 10-year nominal yield mirror one another. And again, I'm skipping a lot of things. I don't really care. I'm not going to get into all that stuff. Uh, I'm just giving the very broad overview because I get asked about it a lot. So, at the end of the day, you need to know what is going on with the risk-free rate, the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. And if you have this other macro asset class that is that closely tied to the price action of the risk-free rate, then it certainly is something to pay attention to. Okay, so for that reason alone, you should be watching dollar yen. Now, going further... You should be watching the correlation between 10-year U.S. Treasury yields and dollar yen because it can and often does uh, serve as a way to sort of get an idea of or monitor the behavior of capital that is being deployed out of Japan overseas. Japan has the largest net international investment position in the world. Net international investment position is how much capital... Um, is being invested abroad versus how much is being uh, invested into uh, your country. Japan deploys the most capital uh, more than anyone else, and the United States actually has the most, you know, negative net international investment position. Uh, In other words, to put it in a more sort of practical sense, Japan is cash-rich, yield-starved, and needs to find a yield for its capital. 